Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. When you take the Word of God and take that incorruptible seed into your heart, all of a sudden you see yourself healed. Long before you feel yourself healed, long before the doctor says you're healed, you see it in your heart first. And then over a period of time, it comes to birth and that thing is produced. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm nearing the end of my sixth week of teaching through the book of Romans verse by verse. We have a brand new book out on this where I've not only taken a teaching where I just expound on the verses, but I've also got all of my footnotes from my living commentary uh, in here. It's a very thick book and... uh, I tell you, this will be a blessing to you. So I encourage you to please get it. I've got a lot of other materials and we'll be giving out all of that information at the end of our program. I've been teaching through the book of Romans and we're now in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 12. Let me just back up and read verse 11. This is where I ended yesterday. And it says... BUT IF THE SPIRIT OF HIM THAT RAISED UP JESUS FROM THE DEAD DWELL IN YOU, HE THAT RAISED UP CHRIST FROM THE DEAD SHALL ALSO QUICKEN OR MAKE ALIVE YOUR MORTAL BODIES BY HIS SPIRIT THAT DWELLETH IN YOU. VERSE 12, THEREFORE, BRETHREN, WE ARE DEBTORS, NOT TO THE FLESH, TO LIVE AFTER THE FLESH. FOR IF YOU LIVE AFTER THE FLESH, YOU SHALL DIE. BUT IF THROUGH THE SPIRIT YOU DO MORTIFY THE DEEDS OF THE BODY, YOU SHALL LIVE. I'VE MENTIONED THIS ON PREVIOUS BROADCASTS, BUT JUST REAL QUICKLY, WHEN IT'S TALKING ABOUT FLESH, IT'S NOT JUST TALKING ABOUT LIKE SKIN, LIKE WHAT WE USE THE WORD FLESH. THIS IS TALKING ABOUT JUST WHEN YOU LIVE BY YOUR OWN ABILITY, WHEN YOU LIVE OUT OF YOURSELF, WHEN YOU DEPEND UPON YOUR OWN UNDERSTANDING. YOU KNOW, IT SAYS IN PROVERBS 3, 5, TRUST IN THE LORD WITH ALL OF THY HEART AND LEAN NOT UNTO THINE OWN UNDERSTANDING. IN ALL THY WAYS ACKNOWLEDGE HIM AND HE SHALL DIRECT THY PATHS. THAT'S THE FLESH THAT HE'S TALKING ABOUT. DON'T LEAN ONTO YOUR OWN UNDERSTANDING. DON'T THINK THAT YOU RELATE TO GOD BASED ON YOUR GOODNESS AND HOW HOLY YOU'RE LIVING. INSTEAD, APPROACH GOD THROUGH FAITH IN JESUS AND WHAT JESUS HAS DONE. APPROPRIATE RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD THROUGH FAITH IN JESUS AND WHAT HE DID FOR YOU. THAT'S WHAT IT'S TALKING ABOUT. AND IT SAYS UP HERE IN VERSE 10, WE ALREADY TALKED ABOUT THIS, YOUR BODY IS DEAD BECAUSE OF SIN. THAT DOESN'T MEAN THAT YOU AREN'T BREATHING, THAT YOUR HEART'S NOT PUMPING. IT'S TALKING ABOUT THAT THE BODY, YOUR PHYSICAL ABILITIES, YOU ARE INCAPABLE OF PLEASING GOD AND RELATING TO GOD THROUGH JUST YOURSELF. YOU ARE SEPARATED FROM GOD BECAUSE SIN HAS CORRUPTED YOUR MIND, IT HAS CORRUPTED YOUR BODY, AND WE JUST AREN'T ABLE TO RELATE TO GOD BASED ON PHYSICAL THINGS. YOU HAVE TO DO IT THROUGH THE SPIRIT. JESUS SAID IN JOHN 4, 24, THAT GOD IS A SPIRIT, AND THOSE WHO WORSHIP HIM MUST WORSHIP HIM IN SPIRIT AND IN TRUTH. YOU HAVE TO RELATE TO GOD THROUGH THE SPIRIT. AND SO WHEN IT SAYS WE ARE DEBTORS NOT TO THE FLESH TO LIVE AFTER THE FLESH, BECAUSE WE HAVE BEEN CORRUPTED, EVERY ONE OF US, SIN HAS KEPT US FROM BEING ABLE TO RELATE TO GOD IN THE PHYSICAL AND JUST IN THE EMOTIONAL REALM. WE HAVE TO DO IT THROUGH THE SPIRIT. THEREFORE, WE OUGHT TO PUT THE PRIORITY ON THE SPIRIT IS WHAT THIS IS SAYING. VERSE 13, FOR IF YOU LIVE AFTER THE FLESH, YOU SHALL DIE. ULTIMATELY, THIS IS TALKING ABOUT PHYSICAL DEATH WHERE WE LEAVE THIS BODY AND WE GO INTO ETERNITY, BUT IT'S NOT LIMITED TO THAT. IF YOU LIVE AFTER THE FLESH, IF YOU ARE TRYING TO DO THINGS JUST ON YOUR OWN POWER, YOU'RE GOING TO DIE. AND DEATH HERE ISN'T LIMITED TO PHYSICAL DEATH, BUT THIS IS TALKING ABOUT YOU'RE GOING TO BE POOR. POVERTY IS AN EXPRESSION OF DEATH. THERE WAS NO SUCH THING AS LACK OR NEED. BEFORE ADAM AND EVE SIN, ROMANS CHAPTER 6, VERSE 23 SAYS, THE WAGES OF SIN IS DEATH. ANYTHING THAT COMES AS A RESULT OF SIN IS DEATH. SO POVERTY IS DEATH. Uh, DEPRESSION IS DEATH. SICKNESS IS DEATH. BITTERNESS, HURT, PAIN, DEPRESSION, FEAR, ON AND ON. YOU COULD GO LISTING THINGS. DEATH ISN'T LIMITED TO JUST PHYSICALLY DYING. BUT IF YOU LIVE AFTER THE FLESH, IF YOU ARE DOING THINGS BY YOUR OWN ABILITY, YOU ARE GOING TO BE SEPARATED FROM THE LIFE THAT GOD HAS FOR YOU. 
If, you, IF YOU'RE JUST TRUSTING IN YOURSELF, IF YOU ARE DEALING WITH PROBLEMS IN JUST YOUR OWN ABILITY, LIKE TAKE, FOR INSTANCE, THE PANDEMIC THAT HIT IN 2020, IF YOU'RE JUST DEALING WITH THIS AS A PHYSICAL, NATURAL HUMAN BEING, THERE'S GOING TO BE FEAR. THERE'S GOING TO BE PANIC. I ACTUALLY TALKED TO SOMEONE THAT THEIR NEIGHBOR JUST CAME OUT OF THEIR HOUSE FOR THE FIRST TIME IN ONE YEAR, AND THEY WERE ACTUALLY WEARING A GAS MAST. THAT'S A PERSON WHO WAS LIVING AFTER THE FLESH. THEY WEREN'T WALKING IN ANY FAITH. THEY WEREN'T STANDING IN THEIR AUTHORITY IN CHRIST. I DON'T EVEN KNOW IF THEY WERE DESCRIBING SOMEONE WHO WAS A CHRISTIAN, BUT THEY COULD HAVE BEEN A CHRISTIAN, BUT WHOEVER THAT WAS THAT STAYED JUST SHUT UP FOR A YEAR AND CAME OUT WEARING A GAS MASK, I GUARANTEE YOU, YOU DON'T KNOW YOUR RIGHTS AND PRIVILEGES. YOU ARE WALKING AFTER THE FLESH. THAT'S WHAT THIS IS TALKING ABOUT. AND IF WE LIVE AFTER THE FLESH, YOU SHALL DIE. YOU WILL BE IN FEAR. YOU WILL BE ISOLATED. YOU'LL BE LONELY. YOU'LL HAVE DEPRESSION AND DISCOURAGEMENT. ALL OF THOSE THINGS ARE THE RESULT OF WALKING IN THE FLESH. BUT IF YOU THROUGH THE SPIRIT DO MORTIFY THE DEEDS OF THE BODY, YOU SHALL LIVE. AND THROUGH THE SPIRIT, HERE IT'S TALKING ABOUT THROUGH THE POWER OF THE HOLY SPIRIT, NOT IN A a MASOCHIST TYPE OF WAY WHERE YOU JUST HATE YOURSELF AND YOU'RE CONSTANTLY ABUSING YOURSELF. NO, BUT THROUGH THE SPIRIT, IF YOU RECOGNIZE THAT MY LIFE COMES THROUGH THE SPIRIT, NOT THROUGH THE FLESH, SO THEREFORE I AM NOT GOING TO INDULGE THIS FLESH. I AM NOT GOING TO EMPOWER THIS FLESH. THIS IS ALL WHAT uh, FASTING IS ABOUT. IT'S NOT JUST DOING WITHOUT FOOD. IT'S NOT THE FACT THAT WHEN YOU DO WITHOUT FOOD, SOMEHOW OR ANOTHER, GOD IS MORE PRONE TO ANSWER YOUR PRAYERS. BUT WHEN YOU GO WITHOUT FOOD, WHEN YOU FAST AND YOU SAY, GOD, I AM PUTTING MY ATTENTION ON YOU. I AM EXALTING THE SPIRIT MAN. MAN DOES NOT LIVE BY BREAD ALONE, BUT BY EVERY WORD THAT PROCEEDS OUT OF THE MOUTH OF GOD. I'M NOT JUST NOT EATING, BUT I'M TAKING THAT TIME AND I AM REFOCUSING ALL OF MY ATTENTION TOWARDS THE SPIRIT REALM. THAT'S WHAT EMPOWERS YOU. THAT'S WHAT MAKES FASTING WORK. YOU, THROUGH THE SPIRIT, ARE MORTIFYING THE DEEDS OF THIS BODY. YOU ARE TELLING YOUR BODY THAT, LOOK, I AM NOT GOING TO LET YOU TELL ME HOW MUCH TO EAT, WHEN TO EAT, WHAT TO EAT. I AM GOING TO TELL YOU WHEN I EAT. I'M GOING TO CONTROL YOU. AMEN. BOY, THIS IS A TOUCHY SUBJECT. THERE'S A LOT OF CHRISTIANS THAT YOU KNOW, LET'S TALK ABOUT SIN. LET'S TALK ABOUT ALL THESE OTHER THINGS, BUT DON'T TALK ABOUT WEIGHT. I'M TELLING YOU, WEIGHT IS REFLECTIVE OF HOW MUCH CONTROL THE SPIRIT IS HAVING OVER YOU BECAUSE YOU NEED TO CONTROL YOURSELF. THE BIBLE TALKS ABOUT THAT. WE'RE SUPPOSED TO GLORIFY GOD IN WHATSOEVER WE EAT OR DRINK. WE'RE SUPPOSED TO DO EVERYTHING UNTO THE GLORY OF GOD. AND SO WE NEED TO LEARN HOW TO MORTIFY THE DEEDS OF THE BODY, THE FLESH, AND THEN IT SAYS IN VERSE 14, FOR AS MANY AS ARE LED BY THE SPIRIT OF GOD, THEY ARE THE SONS OF GOD. THIS IS HOW WE'RE SUPPOSED TO LIVE, IS TO BE LED BY THE SPIRIT, NOT LED BY THE FLESH. NOT GET TO THE POINT WHERE BECAUSE YOU HAVE A PAIN IN YOUR BODY, YOUR BODY JUST DOMINATES YOU. YOU NEED TO STOP THAT, AND YOU NEED TO TELL YOUR BODY THAT, HEY, I'M IN CONTROL. THE BORN AGAIN ME, THE SPIRIT MAN IS GOING TO DOMINATE YOU. AND YOU KNOW, LET'S let's JUST TAKE, FOR INSTANCE, THAT YOU HAVE A PAIN IN YOUR BODY. AND SO YOU SAY, BODY, IN THE NAME OF JESUS, YOU'RE HEALED. AND YOUR BODY SAYS, WHO ARE YOU TO TELL ME ANYTHING? I TELL YOU WHEN TO EAT, WHAT TO EAT, HOW MUCH TO EAT. YOU HADN'T TOLD ME ANYTHING. I'VE BEEN CONTROLLING YOU FOR THE LAST TWO DECADES, AND HERE YOU ARE TELLING ME THAT I'VE GOT TO QUIT HURTING, AND YOUR BODY WILL REBEL AT THAT. SO YOU KNOW WHAT YOU DO? YOU FAST. AND YOU SAY, ALL RIGHT, BODY, I'M GOING TO BRING YOU INTO SUBJECTION AND LET YOU KNOW THAT IT'S THE SPIRIT MAN THAT THE LIFE REALLY COMES FROM. JAMES CHAPTER 2, VERSE 26 SAYS, AS THE BODY WITHOUT THE SPIRIT IS DEAD, SO FAITH WITHOUT WORKS IS DEAD ALSO. SO IT'S SHOWING YOU THAT THE SPIRIT IS WHAT REALLY GIVES LIFE TO THIS BODY. THE SPIRIT SHOULD BE CONTROLLING THE BODY, NOT THE BODY CONTROLLING THE SPIRIT. SO YOU TELL YOUR BODY THAT WE ARE GOING TO FAST AND YOUR BODY WILL FREAK OUT AND SAY, MAN, I'LL DIE IF YOU DON'T FEED ME. WELL, WE'LL GO TWO DAYS THEN. YOUR BODY WILL THROW A FIT AND YOU'LL SAY THREE DAYS AND YOUR BODY WILL RECOGNIZE THAT I BETTER GET IN LINE. AND YOUR BODY WILL FINALLY SLOW DOWN. THOSE those FEELINGS THAT SO EASILY DOMINATE YOU WILL BECOME uh, SUBMISSIVE. 
to the spiritual you. And then when you say body in the name of Jesus, you're healed. I don't care whether you feel like it or not. Your body will go, yes, sir. It'll salute and it'll obey and it'll let the spirit man dominate instead of your physical body. And I'm saying this in love, but there are some of you that you haven't done anything to control your body. Your body controls you. That's against what this is saying. You know, the Apostle Paul said he kept under his body lest while he preaches liberty to other people, he himself would become a castaway and be dominated by just the physical realm. And Paul said over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that he fasted often. He brought his body into control. And so that's what he's talking about right here. Paul's the one who wrote this in verse 13. We by the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is a intimate, familiar term referring to a father, a parent. And so this is saying that we cry, Daddy God, would be a similar translation to this not in disrespect to Him. We need to always fear, reverence, and honor God, but we shouldn't come before Him afraid of something. You know, like if I was in your house and if one of your children came into the kitchen and they fell prostrate on their face and they said, Oh, Mom, I know that I didn't make my bed. I know I haven't done everything. I haven't done all my chores. I haven't done everything, but I'm hungry. Could I please have just a little morsel? I know I don't deserve a whole meal. Could I get just a scrap of something? If your child was to approach you that way, I guarantee you I would know that there is something wrong in your relationship. Even though that child may not have done everything they said, they would come in and they'd say, Mom, please, can I have something to eat? And that familiarity, it's not disrespect. It's actually just a confidence that they, that you love them so much that they know that they can come and get the petitions that they desire of you. Likewise, we can come before our Father and say, Daddy God, Abba Father, not in disrespect, but just confidence that He loves us so much that He's going to grant us our petitions. Man, that's, that's awesome. And so in verse, Uh, 16, it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know, this is another verse that I use often because I have people come forward in my meetings and I pray with them, and many of them will say, Well, how do I know if I'm truly born again? How do I know if I was sincere when I, you know, asked the Lord to come into my heart and things? Well, right here, this says, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It says over in 1 John chapter 5 that we have a witness in ourself, talking about the Holy Spirit. When you get born again, you know that something has happened. I got born again when I was only eight years old, and it was really the very first time that I ever just was totally convicted and knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had rebelled at God, that I had disobeyed God, not just my parents. And I heard a sermon. That happened on like a Saturday. On Sunday, I heard a sermon at church, and the pastor was preaching about a tour of hell. And he not only went through and talked about the rapists and the murderers and the ungodly people that were there, but he talked about good people and showed that there were good people that were going to be in hell, people who lived a good moral life, And man, that shook me to my core. I was only eight years old. But I would basically thought that if you live good and try and do good, that, you know, if your good outweighs your bad, that somehow or another you'd be accepted. And when I heard that, I remember going home from church and I asked my dad. And I said, what is this talking about? And he sat down and explained to me that it's not good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. It's forgiven people that go to heaven and people who didn't accept that forgiveness that go to hell. And he presented the truth to me. And so he prayed with me. And prior to that, I just was in turmoil. I was fearful. I was worried about, am I right with God? And when I prayed and made Jesus the Lord of my life right there in my bedroom with my dad, 
I didn't have bells and whistles or I didn't see anything in the natural, but all of a sudden that turmoil was gone and I just had a supernatural peace come over me. And I remember I went outside and started playing as an eight-year-old kid. But I remember, I still remember that all of a sudden just peace came over me. That was the Spirit itself bearing witness with my spirit that I was okay with God, that I had been forgiven of my sins and that He had accepted me. And so it could be different for different people, but the Holy Spirit will bear witness in your heart and share with you that you have been born again. In verse 17, "...and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together." Man, this is awesome. You know, it's one thing to think that God would forgive us of our sins and not punish us forever in hell. If that's all there was to salvation, that would be more than any of us deserve, and that would be enough to serve God for. That would be enough to be on television preaching and telling other people about it. But true salvation is much more than that. It's not only getting your sins forgiven and avoiding punishment, but we become an heir of God and actually a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus earned through His performance, I get not through performance, but by putting faith in Christ, and I become a joint heir with Jesus. Everything that Jesus has, I have. In my spirit, it's already a reality. And to the degree that I can believe and by faith reach over there and appropriate it and bring it into the physical realm, I can have everything that Jesus has right now in this physical life. Some people think, no way. Well, the Bible says Galatians 1, 4, that Jesus gave Himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world. Yes, there is a deliverance from the future evil world, hell, but in this present evil world, He gave Himself to deliver us from this present evil world. You know, in Matthew chapter 6, the verses that we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer, He says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can pray for the will of God to be done here on the earth the way that we are talking about being in heaven. There are some denominations that sing this song about when we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be, in the sweet by and by. But in the rough now and now, they just think that you have to suffer through this life just like a person that doesn't know the Lord, and it's only in heaven that we're going to experience our salvation. But it's not just in the sweet by and by. It's now in the rough now and now. It's not just you know, further along, but you can have steak on the plate while you wait. Amen? Praise God, you can have that now. We are heirs right now, joint heirs with Christ. Another aspect of this, and I haven't got time to go into this in detail, but when you become a joint heir, that means that it is like you have to co-sign a check to make a withdrawal from the account. It's not one person can do it, it has to be both. The Lord has made us joint heirs with Him, and this has good and bad things associated with it. One of the good things is that we have access to everything that Jesus has, and He's already uh, given us that. But unless we co-sign, unless we get into faith, and unless we begin to believe and receive, it doesn't just automatically happen. It has to have our cooperation. Another positive benefit of this is that in the way that Adam and Eve, they gave their authority and power to the devil, and they basically signed over this world and the authority over this world to the devil. Well, praise God, that's never going to happen again because even if we were to make an agreement with the devil and give him authority in our life, Jesus won't co-sign with us. He will not agree with that. So this means that the authority and the power that God has given the believer is now secure. It's never going to pass back to the devil. You might be able to empower the devil in some specific situation in your life, but never again will Satan become the god of this world and dominate and lord it over people. Jesus beat him, and we now have that same authority and power, and he is not going to agree with us and give this authority to the devil the way that 
Adam did. Adam wasn't a joint heir. He was just an heir of God, and he gave away his inheritance. But Jesus bought it back, and we are now joint heirs with him. In verse 18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And again, this verse, man, there's so much in this. I encourage you to get, get all of these materials, spend time studying, and just milk these truths for all they're worth because there's a lot in this. But this says that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to even be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, there are some people that have suffered more than others in this life. There are some people that have had physical handicaps. There are some people like I was just visiting with someone and they were talking about, they were from Nigeria and they were talking about the Christians that are being persecuted in Nigeria, the young children that are being taken captive and forced into the sex trade, uh, the people that have gone through the Holocaust. There are some people that have had terrible, terrible, terrible things happen to them. And some people just can't even understand how that when we die and pass from this life into the next, how you could ever uh, get over some of these things. But this says that the sufferings we have here in this life aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us in the future. What God has for us is so glorious. Over in the book of Isaiah, I think it's either chapter 65 or 66. I'd have to look it up. It says the former things will never even come to mind. We are going to be so overwhelmed with what God has provided for us in heaven that nobody is going to be in heaven licking their wounds and still suffering and traumatized over things that have happened. God is going to wipe all tears from our eyes. And I mean, we are, it, heaven is going to be a blast. Nobody is going to even remember the former things. They won't even come to mind. The glory is going to be so great that the suffering down here is going to seem like nothing in comparison. And notice also it says in that 18th verse, this glory that shall be revealed in us, not to us. When we get to heaven, it's not going to be like all of a sudden, then we will see what was out here in heaven and in eternity, and that's going to impress us. But instead, we will know all things, even as also we are known, and we're going to get a revelation of what is in us. Right now, you have the glory of God in you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that you have been called to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the glory of God in you. It's not going to be revealed to you out there. Your eyes are going to be open to see what you had all along. And I think one of the reasons God's going to have to wipe tears away from our eyes isn't because we all just barely limped into heaven. BUT IT'S WHEN WE GET TO HEAVEN AND WE KNOW ALL THINGS AND THEN WE SEE THE RESURRECTION POWER, THE GLORY, THE THINGS THAT GOD HAD PUT ON THE INSIDE OF US, THERE IS GOING TO BE WEEPING AND WAILING AND GNASHING OF TEETH WHEN WE REALIZE, I DIDN'T HAVE TO PUT UP WITH THIS SICKNESS, WITH THIS POVERTY, WITH THIS ANGER, WITH THIS HURT, WITH BEING OFFENDED MY WHOLE LIFE. AND THERE'S GOING TO BE WEEPING AND WAILING AND GOD'S GOING TO HAVE TO WIPE TEARS AWAY FROM OUR EYES. BUT THIS GLORY IS ALREADY IN US.